So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Mosley. Jeff is a professor of range science and works statewide and um, uh, range management specialist for the Montana State University Extension Service. Jeff is a uh, MSU alumni. Jeff and I actually went to school together here in range science a few years back and holds graduates just <laughs> not not much at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, Jeff holds graduate degrees from the University of Idaho and Texas Tech. Before returning to Montana in 1995, Jeff served on the faculties of the University of Arizona and the University of Idaho. Jeff's work focuses on grazing management, emphasizing invasive plants, livestock relations with fish, wildlife, and collaborative conservation. Jeff has served as the International Society of Range Management President and also on the Range Science Education Council. Honors and awards included teaching and academic advising from the University of Arizona, the University of Idaho, and the Range Science Education Council. Jeff received the Visionary Leadership Award from Montana State University Extension, and in 2012, Jeff was named as a fellow of the Society for Range Management. And with all of that, Jeff actually just finally retired from something, what was it, last year or the year before? He was been the football coach at uh, White Sulphur Springs for mm. 10 years, so assistant. a diverse background. Oh, yeah. assistant, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't want to claim all that. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, Pat, I appreciate that. Very appreciative of, of uh, the invitation to speak with you here today. Thank you for attending. I know everyone's busy, uh, whether you're viewing remotely or here in person, you all have other things you could be doing with your time, so I appreciate your, your participation. And uh, look forward to your comments and discussion when we finish up. Uh, we're going to talk about targeted livestock grazing, as you know. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to me. It's been a, an active part of my research program for about 30 plus years, and uh, hopefully for several more to go. Um, but I'm not the only one at MSU, uh, certainly not the only one in North America, definitely not even the only one at MSU who has done considerable work with targeted livestock grazing. Uh, many of my colleagues currently and former colleagues uh, have participated in this. And actually, MSU is one of the hubs for, for this focal area, if you will, of research. So it, it's a pleasure to, to visit with you. My goal here is uh, to discuss and review some of the general concepts, use some of my research, and my is in quotes, right? Because it's always a, a collaborative process. And, and uh, I thought about trying to name various colleagues and everything, but I would invariably not name someone, and, uh, and that wouldn't be unfair. So for those of you who, who, who are one of those, um, you know that I know and uh, I appreciate it, and we've had some, a lot of fun and learned a lot. But so I want to use some of, of my research experiences to highlight and, and reinforce some of the concepts, and then, uh, if nothing else, my, my ultimate goal is to try to stimulate your brains. Uh, stimulate your thoughts about how maybe you could use or incorporate targeted livestock grazing into your own research, uh, into your own management or teaching activities. So that's our, that's our goal, and we'll see how, how it goes. So, um, Start off by reminding everybody that grazing is a very powerful thing, right? And it's amazing where they put that fence line, right? All the rocks are just on the right-hand side and all the grass is on the left. Well, obviously that's not the case. That's actually a grazing induced change. Fortunately, that's not from Montana. That's from the hill country, the Edwards Plateau of Texas. Uh, in general, Montana is very blessed. We have had a history of very good, solid uh, grazing management. But the point of this slide is just to illustrate that if you do it wrong, you can create some real problems. And we certainly have those, you know, some of those examples in Montana um, and, and elsewhere across the world. But this is also an old picture and, and things hopefully are, are getting better and they are across the world. But when you see something like this, you see a, an overgrazed spot, you see a spot that's been degraded, um, you, you begin to wonder about the idea of trying to use livestock grazing as a positive tool. And uh, certainly this kind of grazing is, is not the goal, right? So it's important to try to point out this difference 
there's a very important difference between livestock grazing that's promoting weeds and degrading rangelands, right, versus what we're going to talk about, livestock as a tool in vegetation management. They are different. They use the same tool, but hopefully for much different objectives. And the best analogy that I've come across, and this isn't my original thought, but the best analogy that I know of, compares targeted livestock grazing to snake venom. Okay? Because if you think about it, the poison that's in snake venom, snake venom, in that form and in that concentration is quite malicious, right? It's toxic, it's poisonous, it can kill you, all right? But did you know that the very same compounds that are in snake venom are what are in the compound for correction, right? The medicine that saves you, right? It's the same stuff. So what's different? The way it's packaged, the way it's managed, Okay? And that's the point then about livestock grazing. The way it's done, the way it's managed and applied, makes all the difference in the world. Right? So this difference between uncontrolled or improper grazing, this idea of targeted grazing, using livestock to purposely accomplish some kind of an objective in an integrated system. Right? But this isn't a new idea either. The first time that I know of it that it appeared in the research literature was in 1933 by a familiar name to all of you, Aldo Leopold, uh, widely regarded as the father of wildlife management in North America. And if you remember, Leopold said this, that the very things that destroyed it, destroyed wildlife habitat and destroyed game, okay, the ax, the cow, plow, fire, and the gun are the very tools that you can be used to restore them and enhance them. So Leopold was doing this and thinking about it a long time ago, um, and hopefully the science has progressed since then, but that's the first time I know of where the idea is written down. So conceptually, if you're trying to devise a way to use livestock as a tool, and I have a very simple brain, so I tend to think in fairly simple terms, but it's basically this, it's the idea that what I'm going to try to do is figure out a way, if possible, to use livestock to suppress what I don't want, okay? Suppress the undesirable vegetation. You probably can't eradicate it, but I'm going to try to change it. And I, what I may not like about it maybe is the composition of it, this plant species composition. Maybe I don't like the height. Maybe I don't like the structure, okay? Uh, maybe I'm trying to suppress reproduction. Figure out what it is you want to try to do that that's the goal. And then in the process, what I'm trying to do is to enhance the desired vegetation. So we were talking earlier, this requires you to decide up front what is undesired and what is desired. And then once you know that, then you can try to think about how you might design a grazing program to achieve that. Right? And then, of course, you have to figure out if it's possible to do that with livestock and do it in a way that continues, maintains, is compatible with livestock health and well-being. For example, if the target plant that you're trying to suppress, the undesirable vegetation, is a poisonous plant to a certain species of livestock, probably not going to be a very good match. Right? You're probably not going to be, you wouldn't want to, nor would any livestock producer want to, to do that. So there are going to be times when this tool won't work. Okay. Um, and I guess the one analogy that's, that's worth bringing up is, you know, if, if, uh, if you've ever been around a really good carpenter and they're really good with a hammer, it's amazing how screws begin to look like nails, all right? Anybody ever done that? I'll admit that. I've tried to pound a screw with a hammer, right? Okay? Because the hammer's easier to operate. Or maybe I'm more comfortable holding a hammer than I am a screwdriver. And I've been accused at times well, you like livestock and you like this concept, and so you try to apply it all the time. It's not a panacea. It's not the perfect tool. It doesn't work everywhere, right? So it's just one tool that can be added to the toolbox, and maybe there are ways to incorporate it, integrate it in with some other tools. And I'll see if we can stimulate your brain now. So start off thinking about what it is that grazing does. Okay, 
And basically, livestock grazing does two things directly. It defoliates plants and it tramples soils and vegetation, right? So what you're trying to do is that's what you're gonna to try to harness, right? If we do that, we can accomplish certain things to plants if we manage it purposefully this way. We can reduce the energy reserves that are stored in the roots and stored in the stem bases, right? We can reduce the photosynthetic machine by reducing leaf area and thereby reducing root growth, reducing stem growth, reducing leaf growth, right? And we could potentially reduce viable seed production. Those are at least some of the things, some of the, the ways that we could use grazing, using defoliation and trampling to accomplish some objectives. So if you have a, some vegetation that has some of those things that you'd like to reduce, grazing might be a suitable approach. One thing that also always comes up, especially as we talk about reducing viable seed production, is uh, the idea of undesirable plants, weeds or other undesirable vegetation being in the, in the poop, being in the feces of the livestock. So it's probably a good idea to, to address this head on. It's true. When uh, animals consume viable seed, it's a pretty simple system. What goes in must come out, and it does. Okay. So when livestock consume viable seeds of plants, some of that seed will be exited, will be defecated out as viable seed, but very little. So every seed that gets eaten uh, reduces the, number, the amount of viable seed that's going to be on the ground if it had not been eaten because the digestive process destroys the seed coat and the, the seeds that come out then are no longer viable. The digestibility in that process, depending on the seed and the size and the thickness of the seed coat and when it's done, et cetera, reduces viability at least 60% in the studies that have been done and up to 100%. But if it doesn't reach 100%, some of them are going to pass. The good news is that most of those seeds, those viable seeds, are passed fairly really quickly, within three to five days. And uh, myself and others, we've, we've done this kind of work. It's, it's not the most glamorous work, but the way you, you figure this out is uh, you gavage, uh, put seeds. Usually what we've done is put about 5,000 seeds into a feeding tube and put them into the stomach of an animal, and then you uh, collect the feces for every day for maybe 10 days on today, and then you sort through that, and then you collect the seeds, and then you test them for viability. So if anybody really wants that experience, we can, we can try to line you up. But in that, those kind of studies have been done with different kinds of seeds, different kinds of herbivores, and uh, as I said, most of the viable seeds passed fairly quickly. So if, if they're grazing, uh, if livestock or other herbivores are grazing, viable, undesirable seeds, some of those seeds are likely to be passed through, but there will be less than there would have been if they hadn't grazed, right? Just through the digestive process. If the grazing occurs when the seeds are not viable, then obviously they can't pass viable seed. They don't become viable somehow through the digestive process, right? So the timing of the grazing in relation to the viability of the seed becomes important. If the animals are grazing an area when the seed is viable, and if they're going, those animals are going to be transported, relocated to an area maybe that doesn't have that undesirable vegetation, a common practice is to dry lot those animals, put them in a corral for a few days, let them defecate out those seeds, any of the seeds that might be there, where they're easily located and dealt with before then the animals are, are moved to the new place. And that's usually about three to five days then accomplished. Three steps in general, if you're trying to develop a, a targeted grazing prescription, and so if you're trying to think about ways you might incorporate this in your own work, uh, timing, frequency, and intensity. When people talk about grazing management, that's the items, those are the things that you control in grazing management, that you manage, the timing, when the grazing occurs, the frequency, how often it occurs, and then the intensity, how intensively the defoliation is. Those are the things that you're really managing. And so the first step is to figure out what's the best time to do this, to put pressure on the target plant. 
So you need to study everything you can about the ecology of your targeted vegetation to try to understand that. And maybe in the past where you spent all the time trying to figure out how grazing might not harm that, desire, that vegetation, now you're turning it on, on its end and you're trying to figure out how to do everything differently. You're, just, you're trying to figure out when it is most vulnerable and in what ways is it most vulnerable to, to defoliation? What's the right timing? What's the right intensity and frequency? This also has to be done in concert too with understanding the desirable vegetation because of course you shoot yourself in the foot if you put a lot of pressure on the undesired vegetation and the target plants, but in so doing, if you put undue pressure on the desired vegetation, many times you make things worse. The other thing to do is to figure out the best animal for the job. And there are differences, as we'll talk about, between animal species, their genetics, their previous experiences. And then trying to figure out, as I said before, how you integrate this into a, into a full system. So first, let's talk about selecting the, the correct timing, frequency, and intensity. Okay? Uh, some of you may be familiar with Sun Tzu. Uh, he was the Chinese war general who came up with this idea of know thy enemy. And uh, so in, in a lot of weed work and, and other things, uh, knowing thy enemy kind of sums it up well. You know, and every good football coach understands this, right? You spend weeks studying game film, trying to figure out the weakness of an individual, you know, an individual player or a team. The same thing goes. You study the ecology then of the plant and the system, the plant community that it's in, trying to understand it completely. And then you try to identify its Achilles heel. You try to identify how you can best suppress it and in turn, best benefit the others. So in general, you're trying to figure out when those plants are most susceptible, but they also have to be relatively palatable, right? In order for the animals to consume, because we're relying on that largely. Sometimes we can use just trampling. We want to try to do this at a time when, and frequency, and intensity when the desired plants will not be harmed. Right? We're trying to shift the competitive advantage to what we want away from what we don't want. And then keeping in mind that the intensity is important that we can't overdo it. And for most of the grasses that we have in Montana and for most of North America, if you can leave a three to four inch stubble at the end of the grazing that occurs during the growing season, those plants quite sustainable. Those plants can, can handle that. In fact, if you think a little bit anthropomorphically for a moment, the plants really don't care you know, how much vegetation is removed as long as there's a minimal amount of residual to carry on and function. And that minimal amount uh, is about three to four inches for most of our desirable grasses. If it's done during growing season, if it's done in dormant season, it can usually be hit or grazed a little bit harder. So palatability plays a big role in this as well, though, because uh, animals are not robots. They make choices. So this becomes one of the fun things about using livestock as a tool, is that they have brains and they have physiological systems that affect what they do, unlike more mechanical methods or chemical methods. And maybe the best way to think about this, to remind you, is to think about that, that buffet line. Right? So you're visiting Golden Corral and Billings, and you go in there, and uh, I can tell you that I prefer steak, all right? If there's steak on that line, I'm going for the steak, all right? That becomes my preferred food, but it's all relative, right? So let's pretend for a moment that, uh, oh, I don't know, Billings Senior football team just got home, and they went through the line ahead of us, and they took all the steak away. And now all that's left is chicken and spam. Well, I don't know about you, but to me, the chicken's looking really good now, whereas before I disdained it, right? So all these things are relative. So it depends on the plants that are there, how palatable they are, how accessible they are, what time of year is this, what other competitors are there. It's a pretty complex system. And then we need to be cognizant of the animals we, check, we use to try to accomplish the tool. So one of the first places to start is to think about their natural habits. The bottom line is that livestock and, and most any herbivore can eat most anything, but they are naturally designed, they have natural tendencies to eat certain things. 
And some of them are more plastic in their diet selection than others, okay? And again, so for example, um, let's start at the bottom and talk about a, a roughage feeder or an, a herbivore that tends to eat a lot of grass. So bison would be this, cattle would be this, right? But there are places uh, and times of year in North America and in Montana when cattle uh, eat very little grass. They can sustain themselves. The whole range livestock industry in the state of Nevada is built on eating sagebrush right? and other salt desert shrubs, which they do quite well. Right? But given to their own volition, they're built, if you will, so that roughage feeders, cattle, bison being two common examples, tend to eat a large amount of grass with the, the green. Somebody not don't want to show up. Anyways, a large amount of their diet would be grass. Conversely, a concentrate feeder, which concentrates on feeding on browse and shrubs, okay, a large portion of their diet is naturally browse overall, on average, okay. And then you have, and that would be things like goats, uh, maybe white tailed deer would be pretty good examples of that. And then you have some intermediate feeders that tend to eat a little bit of each. And again, those are fairly plastic, uh, but sheep, uh, pronghorns to some extent, uh, Elk, good example, tend to be in the intermediate feeding category. So selecting, you can start there to figure out which animal best suits your goal. If you're trying to, in other words, if you're trying to suppress shrubs and trying to reduce the shrubs, right, and you're trying to do that through defoliation or stem eating, browse eating, then you probably want an animal, or at least think about an animal, that tends to do that. So a goat is a great example. Now, can you do it with cattle? You bet, you could, but it's gonna be more difficult. And maybe you, could only, you can only do it in certain times, you're gonna to have to make other allowances. So you can start here. But there are major differences between individuals within a species. Uh, you know, when we take a look at, say you look at a group of sheep, right? And to us, maybe they all kind of look the same, right? All right, there's Dolly. I mean, we're looking for Dolly. Have you seen her? Okay, well, she's, you know, about 100 pounds. She's got white wool, uh, black hooves. Pick her out. Right? And maybe the other sheep can tell you who Dolly is, but unless you speak sheep, you're going to have a hard time figuring out. But yet, when you study these animals, you realize that they have vast individual differences. Here's one, the results of one study done by uh, Fred Provenza, who's uh, Professor Emeritus at Utah State and now a Montana resident. But he studied black brush in, in Utah, and he was looking at a, at a herd of goats, okay? And the intake of black brush is shown on the left there, on the vertical axis. And he found that 80% of the goats were eating very little black brush, okay? But there were 20% of goats in that herd, same herd, there were, their diets contained a lot of black brush, right? So there's something different about the goats in the same herd, even though they've been reared in the same environment and had the, all the same genetics. So here's the results of a study that uh, I was fortunate to collaborate with some folks at Texas A&M, and it tends to be a good example to highlight this differences, these differences between individuals. So it started out in, in Texas, they were using goats to try to uh, browse juniper, okay, an undesirable shrub once it gets pretty thick anyways. And over time, they kind of noticed that some of the goats were eating a fair amount of juniper and some were not eating very much. So they actually started to quantify this. And they did this by looking at the feces and using uh, different techniques to quantify the percentage of their diet that was juniper. And they were then able, they crossed those animals, they selectively bred those animals, and they developed two subherds. One that was a high consumer, high juniper consuming group of goats, and one that was a low juniper consuming set of goats. Right? And this was heritable. Okay. We still didn't really understand how, okay, but after several generations of this, uh, it's obviously heritable. So we did this study um, looking at the one of the terpenes that's inside juniper that tends to be a toxin that tends to limit intake and 
if you look, so the red is showing the low juniper consumer goats. Okay, so this is, it, it almost appears backwards, but the low juniper consuming goats have the big red part. <laughs> the high juniper consuming goats have the little blue part. Okay, and the reason for this is on the left hand, the vertical axis, this is the plasma concentration of the terpene camphor that we were looking at, okay? So what happened is after we would inject these animals, okay, with a concentration of this toxin, you look, this is showing the levels in the blood and the low juniper consuming goats, the ones who didn't eat very much juniper, they ended up with quite a bit, a very high concentration of that toxin in their bloodstream. Makes sense then that they were averse to it, so they didn't eat it. Same goats, except they've been selectively bred over time to the high consumer goats, high juniper consuming goats in the blue, showing that what happens when they ate the same juniper is that they didn't get that same response because their blood never picked it up. It was never absorbed. And although we haven't been able to, to complete the research yet to maybe definitively say, it looks pretty true, pretty accurate to say that what's going on is that the toxin's not being absorbed through the epithelial cells in the small intestine. And it's been kind of fun talking to some folks in the medical community uh, this is the same thing that goes on with cancer drugs and the same uh, mechanism that frustrates cancer doctors because they can give a drug to folks to try to combat cancer and some people absorb it and it works and some people don't. And what it looks to be is there's a, a mechanism in the epithelial cells in the lining of the small intestine called efflux transporters and they essentially block certain compounds. And we all apparently differ, just like these goats do, in which efflux transporters we have to combat different compounds. And what's happened is that these juniper-consuming goats, high juniper-consuming goats, have the efflux transporter that blocks that particular toxin. So they don't absorb it, they don't get any negative feedback, they eat lots of juniper. Right? But this idea then, this genetic variation, to me is very exciting, because this is probably the future as we look to try to use the targeted livestock grazing to accomplish different objectives, the genetic makeup of those animals offers us tremendous potential. Where you could, in this case, have a marker where you wanted to, you wanted to select out a set of goats uh, that had that gene, that had that ability, that particular efflux transporter to block that toxin. Then you wouldn't have to wait years of collecting poop and, and uh, breeding, right? You could just Take a hair sample, test the DNA, identify it. And you could, I mean, hopefully your brains can just go wild thinking about the genetic potential. And then figuring out how to incorporate this, once you figure out the timing, the right intensity, the right frequency, and then figuring out how to incorporate this and the right species of animal into a, a bigger picture. So if you think about some of the other tools that we have out there for managing vegetation, right? Herbicides, mechanical treatments, all right? One thing that's been proven is if you, oftentimes if you follow up one of those with targeted livestock grazing, you get a synergistic effect, okay? The other thing you can do in some cases is you can use the livestock to reduce the soil seed bank of the undesirable vegetation before you control it, then come in and control it with mechanical or chemical means, and then thereby make that more effective. I'll talk about biocontrol insects and combining that with grazing in a minute. Grazing animals can be used to create fire lines prior to prescribed burning. A lot of people have used prescribed grazing, targeted grazing, to depress or to limit uh, wildland fuel as well. And then a common use of this tool is to use the animals to revegetate ground that you maybe can't get, a, get equipment on, you can't get a, a seed drill on, or you're trying to reduce the cost. So by broadcasting the seed and then following that up, with a trampling treatment from livestock to increase the soil seed contact uh, is a proven tool. Oh, I mentioned this idea about trying to combine targeted livestock grazing with biocontrol insects. So I'll try to go through this pretty quickly, but 
there was a lot of concern about this in Montana. Montana, as you know, has a long uh, and, and wonderful history, tradition of using biocontrol insects to suppress noxious weeds in our state. And, uh, and so if you've gone through all that effort and time and money, uh, the last thing you want to do is introduce another agent, such as targeted livestock grazing, that might somehow, you know, interfere with those wild control insects. So a lot of folks that had wild control insects out were leery about using livestock grazing. So we were asked, if, you know, what's the potential? Because it kind of makes sense that there's a potential for additive effects, right? I mean, I think of it in terms of the double or triple whammy, uh, where you get the above ground defoliation by the livestock, maybe you get some root damage inflicted by the insects, and then if there are some seed head feeding insects, you can try to get that triple whammy. So we, we did a study, um, and we used the operative word, but we were looking at, at spotted knapweed, and if you're familiar with these, uh, these are kind of the three most effective prime biocontrol insects that we have in our state for, for biological control of spotted knapweed. Cyphocleonis works on the roots. Uh, the larvae eat the root centers. Agapita uh, also works on the roots, but it works on the outside of the roots, cortex. And then Lorinus eats the seeds uh, and makes them unviable when you're developing seed heads. So these were all on a site. And what we did is then is superimpose targeted sheep grazing. So across the top there, bowel control insects only, bowel control plus sheep grazing in July, bowel control plus sheep grazing in August. And then looking at the total seeds, and we kept track of the total seed production. This is in number of seeds per meter squared. And you see that those differences are real, okay? The biocontrol insects, even with all that great work they're doing, there were still 500 viable seeds, or total seeds, excuse me, uh, per meter squared. And that number was reduced significantly by combining the target sheep grazing in July with the biocontrol insects, and significantly reduced even further uh, by combining it with biocontrol sheep, by combining it with sheep grazing in August. Without the, the biocontrol insects, the seed production is around 9,500 seeds per meter squared. So the biocontrol insects were doing a bang up job. They took it from 9,500 to 500, okay? But they didn't get it below the threshold. The threshold to sustain itself, for that population to sustain itself, of spotted knapweed is about 160 seeds per meter squared. So even though they took the biocontrol insects alone, took it from 95 to 500, 9,500 to 500, they're still well above the 160 threshold. So the spotted knapweed community just kind of shrugged that off and kept on rolling, right? But when you get the, in this case, the quadruple whammy, right? You have the agapita, cyphocleonis, marinus, and targeted sheep grazing, you can get that total seed number down below the critical threshold and actually make some progress. But total seeds really aren't the picture that you need to try to keep track of if you're doing this kind of work. It's the viable seeds that really matter. So you need to take it to that next step, in my opinion. And the results are, are even more striking that the viability of those, the number of viable seeds uh, is being reduced dramatically by incorporating the sheep. And then does it matter in terms of the density of the plants? Yes, it does. It, it tracks all the way through. You can dramatically reduce the number of seedlings and juveniles of spotty knackweed. And so we were able to conclude that you could apply the targeted sheep grazing either July or August. It was more effective in July. Together, you'll have 96 to 99% fewer viable seeds than you would if you used biocontrol insects alone. And the End result is that you can actually reduce the plant density of the, bio, of the spotted knapweed. And you didn't harm, we, were, we did not reduce or harm the population of the biocontrol insects. So it really is possible to, to combine those in a synergistic or an additive way. Let me just show you a couple of other examples real quick uh, of people that are using targeted livestock grazing 
uh, across North America, and some of this is from my own work. But one of these areas is with cheatgrass. Um, cheatgrass is an amazing plant. You just about have to bow down and pay it homage. I mean, it is an incredible foe, but know thy enemy, and it has one weakness. Although it produces a lot of seeds, it is really e efficient, and almost all those seeds germinate every year. So the soil seed bank carryover of cheatgrass, that's its Achilles heel. If you can prevent cheatgrass from producing viable seed for two to three years in a row, you can eliminate. Right? Now, of course, you always got other seeds coming in. Right? But you can reduce that soil seed bank to near zero. Right? And this is not new technology. This is, it was actually worked out in the 1940s in Michigan. And it was published in 1940. And what people tell me, and we can figure out, is that people went off to the war, World War II, came back, herbicides became the big thing, and that technology of using livestock grazing controlled cheatgrass, which was initially figured out in alfalfa fields in Michigan, disappeared. In the last 20 years, it's kind of been resurrected. Um, maybe 30 now, I guess. But the idea is you have to defoliate it once, it will try to reinitiate and produce viable seeds again, so you have to come back again one to three weeks later. You need to get there before the seed heads start to turn purple. Even though those seed heads are not quite mature, they are, the seeds in there are already viable. So if you don't make it back, you didn't really accomplish anything. And the, seed, the cheatgrass will typically try to produce another round of a seed head, but it's not, those seeds are typically not viable but you got to get it at least twice. And if you don't, you know, if you want to pra practice or play this at home, just pick out a piece of cheatgrass and, and use a weed whacker. And within two to three years, you should have to go find another spot. So cattle, sheep, this is cattle grazing. Yeah, cattle and sheep have been used this way. Mm -hmm. And another fascinating thing about cheatgrass is that it produces its own uh, perfect uh, environment where cheatgrass can germinate in its own mulch. It doesn't have to have soil contact, contact with mineral soil. And so one of the things cheatgrass does is it builds up the mulch, preventing desirable seeds from being able to reach the soil contact. And then uh, it just kind of perpetuates itself by it can germinate, it can grow, right? So some people have actually used fall grazing to reduce the mulch. And they're actively doing this in Nevada, and it's working very well. Just some more examples. Um, leafy spurge has been attacked with uh, targeted livestock grazing for many, many years in Montana. Okay, the idea is to try to prevent it uh, from going to seed and removing the yellow bracts of the flowers. The seed's not viable at that time. And if you do this repeatedly, research has shown that after about five or six years, you get dramatic reductions in leafy spurge. Just to illustrate this, this is one spot over outside of Deer Lodge. Uh, on the left, showing leafy spurge, that yellowish, greenish plant. Uh, if you look closely in there, you can kind of see the sagebrush plants. And then after six years of sheep grazing, targeted sheep grazing, purposely de designed to reduce the leafy spurge, it looks like it is on the right. Here's another example in the same county, in Powell County. Uh, again, six years. Uh, in sagebrush step, reducing leafy spurge. So it works on a landscape scale as well as in small plots. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out ways to use livestock to suppress spotted knapweed. Uh, basically, we figured out is that if you can, it's, per, it's ideal to try to hit it twice. Um, hit it at the bolting stage, and then again at the flowering stage. One of the problems though is that at the bolting stage, many times the desirable grasses are also palatable. And so we've had better luck if we had to hit, only hit it once and hitting it late when the knapweed is still green, the desirable grasses are largely dormant, they can tolerate the grazing, and they're largely unpalatable compared with the spotted knapweed. And by doing that, the sheep eat a lot of it. Uh, their diet's 45% spotted knapweed. We then 
tried to play around a little bit with how you could integrate sheep into an existing cattle operation. We've tried uh, having the sheep then come in immediately after the cattle. We tried once uh, trying to bring the sheep in about three weeks after the cattle. We, hit, we let the cattle have first choice because uh, there was a lot of concern about the sheep eating cow grass. Okay. So we tried having the cattle go through first, take what they wanted, and then wait for about three weeks to let the grass recover before we brought the sheep in. Well, guess what? That, that didn't work out so well. What do you think was the most palatable, delectable forage in the pasture was the grass that had been grazed three weeks earlier and had not recovered. The sheep ate a lot of grass then and not very much nectar. So what we've been able to figure out is by putting the sheep right behind the cattle, uh, the cattle go through and take what they can, focusing on the grass, reduces the palatability then of the grass, the sheep are even more likely to hit the nap root. And in that work then we kind of started quantifying just how much knapweed the cattle were eating. And if you talk to some folks, they'd say, you know, well, some folks like almost any topic. Some folks would say, cattle, they don't eat any knapweed. Other folks say, yeah, they do. I've seen it. They've never been quantified, right? Well, we were able to figure out that they actually do. Okay. So we started thinking about, well, can we use cattle? All right. Uh, cattle are more numerous in, in Montana, certainly and in North America, and a lot of cattle ranchers really aren't interested in adding sheep to their operation. So what about combining target cattle grazing with biological control insects? And what about maybe this idea of training the livestock to eat spotted napoli? There's been a lot of interest in that in our state. So we did this study, this is up uh, outside of Polson. Uh, it's on the tribal land of the Salish Kootenai. Uh, tell people that I was spending the summers um, working outside of Polson, and oh my gosh, wow, lucky you, that must really be nice, you know, beautiful environment, and it, it is beautiful, it's just a little different. This is one of the driest spots in the entire state, you know, if you realize that, right around Hot Springs, outside of Polson, is an eight-inch precip zone, and uh, one of the dustiest spots there along the, the Flathead River, but beautiful nonetheless, and this is the idea of training, there's been a lot of this promotion where the idea that if you could train livestock to eat a, a certain targeted plant, maybe you could increase its efficacy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that concept had never been tested. And uh, lots of folks uh, across our state and others have invested a lot of time and effort. And we kept getting questions, you know, does this work? And uh, so finally we decided we well, would we'd study it. So the idea is that you put in desirable foods that the livestock know, you put those in a tub, you give them access, they start to associate the tub with the good things that they know. Then you start putting in other known good feeds uh, to the tub and you allow the livestock access novel feeds that they're not familiar with. They then start to associate the tub with a reward, receiving something nutritious. And then eventually you put in something like spotted knapweed, uh, first mixing it a little bit with the desirable feeds and then weaning them off so it's only spotted knapweed. And so we've done that. We did that for three years, and it works. Um, maybe difficult to see, but there's uh, one of those heifers there with a spot of nappy hanging out. So did diet training work? Uh, not for us. So people ask me now, does diet training work? All I can tell you is the only research that I know of is ours. And all I can tell you is that we tried hard. We tried to do it very well. We tried for three, in three separate cases, with three separate sets of, of heifers, and uh, we were not able to increase the amount of spotted knapweed in those cattle diets. We did not increase their preference for it. We didn't increase the utilization of it, the amount of defoliation. We did not increase the amount of seed head removal, flower, and buds. But we didn't do too bad. You look at that spot and apple bud flower seed head removal, we were removing 85% of those flowers and seed heads with cattle grazing, whether they were trained or untrained. And in comparison, we're able to get a little bit better, up to about 96% typically when we use untrained sheep. But that's not too bad for trained or untrained cows. In terms of its effect on the plant community, 
Uh, also, no difference whether they're trained or untrained, but the idea of combining the cattle with the biocontrol insects worked very well. Reduced viable seed production, 71% compared to biocontrol insects alone, and reduced plant density compared to biocontrol insects alone. So not only can you combine the biocontrol insects with sheep, you can do so with cattle as well. And you can get the threshold or the amount below. So we know that, that it works and we've got lots of research. That's about 15 years worth of work in 30 seconds. All right. mm -hmm. But we know it, it can work and it's all about when you, when you graze the cattle at the timing, intensity and frequency to make this work, but they will eat lots of napweed and they will defoliate the flowers and they will reduce the viable seed production and they will reduce the plant community in napweed and increase the proportion of desirable grasses. A couple other quick highlights. Things to think about, expand the brain. This is one we worked on. Uh, Tad, this is up at Sieben Ranch, uh, John and Nina Bacchus, um, where they have quite a significant ponderosa pine encroachment problem in the sagebrush step. Now we spent a few years trying sheep and goats in the winter and, and we're able to successfully suppress encroachment uh, with goat grazing in the winter. Uh, it's a little hard to see there perhaps, but the small trees and saplings and things were, were killed. Uh, the other major impact is that the larger trees, the goats created a browse line, increased the amount of light reaching the, the ground floor and increased the herbaceous production. We've also involved a lot with, uh, with using targeted grazing to try to purposely enhance wildlife habitat. I have current projects right now looking at, at using this with pronghorns and mule deer. Just completed one a little bit ago with elk. Um, I've done so in the past with moose and, and white-tailed deer. I thought I'd wrap up by showing you one study that's we're just wrapping up now. Uh, one of our my co-investigators, Lance McNew, is in, in the back of the room. And the idea was, could we use targeted cattle grazing to try to reduce dense sagebrush? in sage grass brood rearing habitat. And the reason being that uh, in brood rearing, sage grass rely heavily upon the forbs and the insects, the arthropods, that inhabit largely those forb communities. So the dense, the canopy cover of the sage just becomes too thick, crowds out the forbs, crowds out the insects and the understory production. So our idea, the goal, was to try to reduce this, not eliminate it, but just try to reduce the sagebrush density cover and thereby increase these weedy forbs and thereby increase the arthropod community. And by my God, it worked. Okay, well we figured out that moderate cattle use in the fall combined with localized heavily trampling did exactly that. It did reduce the sagebrush cover, it did stimulate forb production, and it did stimulate arthropods. And this is how we did it with supplement tubs. So in this sea of dense sagebrush cover, this is 35 or greater, 35% canopy cover of sagebrush. Uh, the preferred level for sage grouse and broodering habitat is 25%, clearly too dense. By local, locating these tubs strategically, uh, they would concentrate the, mostly trampling. Cattle weren't eating very much of the sagebrush. And there in the top left, you can see what it looked like before we started. And then what we tried to do, we were sculpting the landscape by just setting these tubs wherever you would like, okay? You can localize the trampling disturbance. And by doing it in the fall, when the plants are largely uh, tolerant of any kind of trampling or grazing impacts. This is what it looks like after two weeks there in the bottom left-hand corner, that's after two weeks of access to those tubs. And on the other side, that's what it looks like the first spring, the first June afterwards. And I don't have a picture in here of that particular site, but two summers later, uh, it's quite dramatic. And so, yes. So you might move the tubs this year one place, the next year. Exactly, right. And of course, the sagebrush uh, isn't gone, right? It hasn't been eliminated. So it's, not, it's, it's much, much less invasive 
<clears throat> excuse me, uh, much less of an affront, if you will, to the sagebrush doing it this way because than you would in a burn or with a chemical treatment because the sagebrush is still there, right? So what we're tracking now is how fast it comes back in, but it comes back in fairly quickly. Um, we think we can get about 20 to 25 years um, at the most, and this is in mountain big sagebrush, um, before that will look like it did. But then, like you said, that by moving those tubs around, you can sculpt the landscape. You can create whatever heterogeneity you want, wherever you want it, in proximity to whatever cover or other habitat attributes you might want. And just by concentrating the livestock, no herding, just using tubs. And it worked. For those of you who maybe have worked down south a little bit, this is a real common approach to quail habitat in Texas. And that's where I stole the idea. This is then the idea that in a sea of sagebrush, you can create little pockets of biodiversity of prime food habitat for sage grouse while leaving them the access to cover. So, <clears throat> if you're interested in learning more about uh, target livestock grazing, there are lots of sources out there. One of these, there is a website, uh, Society for Range Management maintains a targeted grazing committee. Uh, and they have a website that has lots of information. There's actually a book, uh, this Targeted Grazing Handbook, was published in 2006. Uh, I have two chapters in there and several folks here, including Pat, who's an author of another chapter and others at MSU. Um, and right now my co-authors and I were in the final throes of finishing up an invited synthesis manuscript in rangeland ecology and management, which should appear in 2019. At least that's what I'm telling my department head on my productivity report. <laughs> so, um, again, questions, discussion in the time we have left about this crazy idea of using livestock as a tool. <laughs> what consideration is given to soils type in planning targeted grazing? Great question. Um, it, if you didn't, weren't able to hear the question remotely, uh, question about soils and what effect soil type might have uh, on where it's most applicable and things, it, it, it does enter into it. So um, it kind of depends what you're trying to do. One thing we found, <clears throat> excuse me, is that uh, the trampling impact on sandy soils, as you might expect, sandy soils not having as much structure uh, can be excessive can, or it can be greater. That can be either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what you're trying to, to stimulate. Um, but the, the traveling impact is greater the, the less clay there is in the soil, right? Um, in terms of, there are also impacts in terms of nutrient cycling, in terms of carbon sequestration that, that revolve around the grazing. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's complex. But it's, it's, it's another thing you need to, to think about what it is you want to do. You know, it's, when we were talking earlier that maybe the, the most difficult part of this is, is like with any kind of habitat modification, you have to decide what you want. And, and what we've been able to show and others is that there often is a way to get there with livestock. Okay? Not always. And not always the appropriate tool. But if you, do, if you tell me what you want, with a little bit of research money maybe and some time, we might be able to figure out how to do it. But what is it that you want? Are you trying to increase soil organic carbon? Are you trying to increase uh, nitrogen mineralization? Are you trying to increase infiltration? You know, all those things have trade-offs. I'm curious for many of the examples, what you use to concentrate the herd they're using um, electric fencing or herders or combination of both and then also with that um, for density are you going for a certain uh, like amount of pounds per acreage or are you just monitoring to determine the effectiveness of a certain concentration of animals at a site? Okay uh, great question so um, in terms of, of animal density so we've done this on small plots and then we've gradually moved to landscape scales and fortunately for us it's it's worked so our smaller plots are fairly large in terms of 
You know, we don't do things in, in real small spots, but like five acre pastures. And then when we've, when we've expanded that into landscape scale studies, it, it still worked. Um, you, you do need to be able to get the animals where you want them, though. So that could involve, you know, temporary fencing. It could involve supplement tubs. It could involve herding. Um, those have been used in some cases, but they're not always necessary. Um, and then I'm trying to remember the second part of your question. Yeah, the density, oh, the density, yeah. Uh, so what we've typically done, okay, you can make your best guess on the stocking rate and the amount of days and the amount of animals um, based on published guidelines and things. But ultimately what, we're, what we focus in on is the desirable vegetation. So we have a target of how much we, we're trying to decrease sagebrush height or sagebrush cover. But more of our focus is really on the desirables because we don't want to, as I said earlier, shoot ourselves in the foot. Okay, so we keep an eye on 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 the residual amount of the desirable vegetation that we're trying to benefit more so than we look at how much we're depressing or defoliating or trampling the undesirable. And that's worked out really well because um, anytime we've goofed, <laughs> anytime we've gone more you know excessive on the desirables, we've paid for that. So, so that's one thing we try to do is identify what, given the timing and the other plants in the plant community, how invasive other, you know, plants might be in the community, and what are other threats, all that kind of stuff. Identify what the thresholds should be for the desirables and then not exceed that. And that, that's worked out pretty well. Yeah. Ranch operations are as variable as the livestock population, and composition. So I'm wondering if you could speak to the types of operations that are in the best position to take advantage of these kinds of tools and, and or you know, where there, there is a real um, you know, friction between conventional operating practices and some of these tools. Well, um, so looking at the, at the opportunities and challenges of, of integrating this kind of an idea into existing operations, um, the operations who are, are the most apt to incorporate this are gonna be you know, your, your better operators who are looking for opportunities, okay? Um, because it does take an elevated level of management, right? Some, some folks are not in a position to be able or don't desire to do that. That's okay, right? I work in the ranch community every day and, and I understand people are people. And the last thing, you know, I never tell anybody what to do. Somebody asked me what they could do, and I, I help them work through the options. But I never tell anybody what to do. I don't, that's completely disrespectful. And, uh, and I don't question anybody's motives. But I do know that people are people, and people have differences, right? Typically, though, to answer your question, the ones who are more interested in, in taking advantage of these opportunities are, are operators who have better control. So maybe they're fortunate that, uh, that they're not pulled away from by an off ranch job, right? Maybe they're fortunate in their labor situation. Or maybe they still have a, a high school kid at home, right? I've seen some of this done, you know, the 14 year old kid who's always spending time going to football camp in the summer, maybe needs to spend more time on horse herding those with livestock around, right? I mean, it just depends. Other folks don't have that. Opportunity. So, you know, um, there are some folks who are in this in the contract game, in the contract grazing game. And this is an opportunity that's expanding uh, in our country where people are being paid specifically to accomplish an objective, both on private and public land. Um, not sure how big that's ever going to get, but it is an emerging industry. And those folks uh, that are getting paid specifically to do it, you know, have to be on top of their game. They have to be, you know, they're the ultimate practicing applied ecologist. I mean, they have to be an expert in animal husbandry. They have to be an expert in plant ecology, and they have to be also be an extra expert in in publicity and personal relations. As you, I mean, I don't remember if you remember, but a few years ago there was a herd of sheep uh, in a subdivision on the, the south end of Bozeman, and uh, recently there was a herd of goats up by the the M, and uh, you get a lot of attention when you show up with with livestock in town and stuff like that. So. How often do you have? 
conflicting targets on the same branch. Would that ever happen at five levels? Yeah, okay. So uh, what do you do? Does it ever happen when you have conflicting vegetation management goals? I'd say every time, okay? So for those of you who, who are wildlife habitat biologists, you recognize, right, maybe the easiest example, you recognize that every species of wildlife has its own niche. It has its own situation, characteristic structure, and composition of plants, et cetera, et cetera, where it thrives. And in almost no case is that exactly the same as another species. They all vary and they overlap some. And some of them are diametrically opposed. So the age old adage is anytime you manipulate habitat, you make it better for something and you always make it worse for something else. Now, did you make it worse or better to the point that it matters? And this point's often overlooked. Unless you affect the limiting factor, whatever's limiting that population from getting bigger or from getting smaller, unless you affect that, you may change the habitat, but you don't change the population. So there are many situations where you could alter the habitat and maybe make it a little less preferred for something without affecting that population. But you will invariably, by natural law, you will make it less preferred, less well suited to something every time you manipulate habitat, no matter what tool you use. I was trying to ask a more geographic okay. question. Okay. Might you target one part of a ranch with, with one oh. approach and different parts of that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, a great example of that would be um, leafy spurge, sulfur sink foil, spotted knapweed. Those three weeds, which are major noxious weeds in our state, they line up perfectly during the time of year when leafy spurge is most vulnerable to being grazed. And actually, you could add cheatgrass on top of that. You could start out using targeted livestock grazing on cheatgrass, then move to leafy spurge, and then move to sulfur zinc foil, and then move to spotted napkin, and keep those animals employed that entire grazing season. From May, April through August, targeting a different, and that's just noxious weeds, but targeting a different plant in different places. And so we, there are animals like that right now in the state that are moving across ranches and across allotments to accomplish different objectives. Let's wrap up. Let's get another round of applause.